Thank you so very much, um, Simon, um, and good evening uh, to you and good evening to all of the colleagues that are joining us um, online and good evening to Sikhe also who's hosting us um, here with Simon. Uh, colleagues, when, when Simon and I were thinking about uh, this evening's uh, conversation, we thought perhaps maybe it might be beneficial to make some remarks about where South Africa's agricultural sector and food prices in general are in the current environment of geopolitics and the destruction um, that we saw in KZN uh, following uh, the floods. And I think that's where the core messaging of, 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 of this um, uh, uh, input uh, I will focus on. And the first point I think to, to begin with is to look at where agriculture is in as far as the growth performance and the jobs before we go into the the pricing and all of those things. And I think this is a sector that has been doing fairly well over the past couple of years. We all saw the 13.4 growth in 2020, 8.3% uh, growth in 2021. All of that underpinned by the fact that this sector was operational throughout the COVID uh, period uh, in various lockdowns, but most importantly, favorable rainfall, expansion in area plantings, farmers able to afford all of the inputs. So this is a sector that has been doing fairly well. And those gains of positive performance have also translated into a growth in employment. You look, for example, on the chart that is on the right-hand side in the, in the in a screen um, on this segment, and you will see that jobs in agriculture have been fairly uh, solid, uh, over 800,000 people that are working in the sector. And in fact, in the last quarter of 2021, we had a growth in employment in agriculture of 7% compared to where we were in 2020, just over 860,000 people that were in this sector. But you fast forward then to say 2022, what is in store for us? We see uh, agriculture contracting this year by roughly anywhere between three and 5% um, in, in our view. Some of the things that are affecting that is of course, initially the base effects coming in all from all of this good performance, the base effect was a story this year. But secondly, when the season started in around about October, uh, one of the key things that we were seeing is all of these floods uh, across South Africa that to an extent uh, uh, negatively affected crop funding, particularly field crop in Central South Africa. You think of maize, soybeans, sunflower seed to an extent. So there were all of those challenges that farmers have faced in them. And I think the case that in challenges in the sugar industry get to be an added factor to what we are seeing. Hence, you see that light bluish line that we show on the screen on the left-hand side chart, which actually speak to that possible contraction in this sector that we are expecting um, this year. So those are the challenges, and that's where the state of agriculture sits at this point. And I think to get a clearer picture of which subsectors matter a lot when we think about growth in the cross value added of agriculture. The good place to start off is this table, which I extracted from work that I had done collaboratively with Professor Johan Kirstin, my, uh, my colleague at Stellenbosch University for, for, for the work in the Oxford Handbook of South African Economy. In that uh, 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 work, one of the key things we tried to understand was to say, from 1994 up until 2018, how has the structure of South African agricultural sector change, particularly the composition of the top 10 uh, products in the, in the cross value added. And you will see that we've seen citrus industry becoming progressively more important um, and maize industry remains important than the others. But these are also the industries that were affected a lot by the points that I've mentioned uh, just previously now. For KZN, for example, sugarcane industry badly affected by the recent floods, but maize industry, uh, in Central South Africa to an extent also negatively affected by those heavy rains since the start of the season. And most of you on the call probably read about the foot and mouth disease, which at this point, South Africa has about 57 outbreaks across the country, which is the record level e ever. And those foot and mouth diseases do mean that the performance of the livestock industry in South Africa is not gonna be as robust as the previous few years. So taking all of that into composition, into order, it is what, uh, has made us inclined to think, in addition to the base effect story, that South Africa's uh, farm economy could somewhat uh, contract this year. And of course, if you look at which regions experience those excessive rains in South Africa, that map on the left-hand side, which shows that the Free State Province, parts of Northwest, Southern parts of Limbopo, 
And in fact, to an extent, even parts of Eastern Cape and Northern Cape are amongst those areas that have experienced record rainfall and that has had um, a negative impact into crops. But I think what we can all agree on is that the South African farmers were able to go back in the fields um, and replant some of the areas at the beginning of January. And that has enabled us to still, despite all of these challenges, to have a decent crop, though it's lower than last year. And the chart on the right hand side speaks to that to say where are the top uh, 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 field crops South Africa's harvest uh, at the moment compared to last year and the long term. We are down from last year and that, that dark blue line of maize harvest just tells you that if you were to compare with where we were last year with the harvest just over 16 million tons on maize. But if you were to look over the long run, these are areas that are fairly uh, well above the long-term averages, which means then that in as far as supplies of the grains and some of the key um, is, is, is oil seeds in South Africa, we are sitting at a fairly comfortable level at this point. But of course, all of this has to be looked at in context with what's going on globally. The point that Simon opened up with to say, uh, looking at all of the dynamics globally, we're trying to understand where we are sitting as South Africa. And that is an important point because right now, we've been at a period where South Africa's commodity prices across the suffix, we've seen prices lifted, uh, trading at very higher level for quite some time. And this is not the story only of the, 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 the geopolitics that we have seen, but it's been the reality since about February last year, where February 2020, where we saw commodity prices rising significantly at, at the JSE, at the, at the suffix side. But of course, that mirrored what was happening in the international market. The chart, for example, that is on the left-hand side on your screen speaks to that. If you look around about mid-2020, you already seen that the cereals prices, vegetable oils prices, sugar prices, and all commodities were really on the upsurge. The key thing that was supporting um, prices globally at that point was, of course, the dryness in South America, which is the major uh, producer of grains, producing over half of, of soy, global soybeans, and also um, a, a significant proportion of, of, of global maize coming out of South America. So it's been fairly dry in that, in that part of the world for the past two seasons. And that added to, to an extent uh, upside pressures on, 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 on commodity prices globally, because that poor harvest had a negative consequences on global stocks of some of the grains. Additional to that, we also had China since the end of the um, the, the swine fever that negatively affected their, their pig industry, they've been buying a lot of grains uh, since then, both for the rebuilding up of their, of, the, of, the, of, the, of their pig industry, but in addition to that, some of it was really the building up of the stocks, uh, and which is a story aside of the hog industry of the Chinese side. There was also a bit of dryness um, in, in, in parts of Asia, particularly Indonesia and Malaysia, and that was negatively influencing palm oil production amongst other crops in there. Those were all factors that supported prices for much of last year globally. And the domestic market also mirrored um, in large part what was happening uh, globally. We had large record harvests in South Africa, but we didn't see that translated into prices because of that international story. Now you fast forward, you look into this year. Now the Russia invasion that begins in Ukraine or just add on as a catalyst on that increase in prices that we already seen. And I think that chart, which is the FAO Global Food Price Index on the left hand side of your screen speaks exactly to that. And I think the new risks now over the past two weeks that has, has emerged is of course uh, uh, Indonesia deciding that the prices of vegetable oils are rising in such a fast, faster pace to the extent that they worry about inflation domestically um, and they've decided that they will ban the exports of palm oil. All of this is also an added risk to those upside prices that we see globally and we see them being mirrored in the domestic side. And of course, they have implications that when we think about food price inflation in South Africa, which basically means then that the food price inflation, which has been muted for some time, and that's the picture that you are seeing on the right hand side of South Africa. And I use the word muted cautiously because I'm comparing that period with the periods where we have had double digit food price inflation, which is around about 2016 during the droughts and, and all of those years. Now, the key products that we see as an upside risk to the food price inflation basket in South Africa is the grains um, and cereals 
um, is, is, is the cereals and bread, which is basically the grains, and also the vegetable uh, oils, which in the CPI basket, they are labeled as oils and fats. Those are the key products. The ones that we expect them to moderate to an extent is fruits and vegetables, and to an extent also meat. Fruits will moderate uh, to an extent because we are a net exporting country of fruit, but also some of the, the about 12% or so of our citrus goes to the Black Sea countries. We also export some deciduous fruits in there. So with those exports now not viable at this year in this year because of everything that is happening in the Black Sea, we think that is going to add downward pressure on the domestic fruit prices. And we do see pressures also coming in in the vegetable industry, which then taking that into consideration and also thinking about the foot and mouth disease, which is affecting the livestock industry and has meant that South Africa is no longer going to be in a position to export um, uh, red meat because of that foot uh, of that foot and mouth diseases for a period of maybe even a year onto that. Now you think about all of those dynamics, it means that there might be a slight increase on the red meat supplies, a slight increase on the vegetable oil supplies in South Africa, and all of that then adding downwards pressure. And you think about all of that in basket, we think that South Africa's food price inflation could average at anywhere between around about 6%. That's our view, baseline view. But of course, there's always upside risk, which I think could push that number to anywhere around about 6.5% or so, which is almost equal to where we were last year. So that's our thinking when we think about food price inflation. We have these other products that are, are, are moderating and the others that are increasing. And then if you think about base effects, it will still keep us on that single digit uh, when we think about food price inflation um, in Africa over the medium term. And I guess this is also a position to add that um, even in as far as the supplies of a number of products, we South Africa imp imports about uh, in, in large proportion about five products, uh, food products that I think are key. Of course, there's a range of things that we are importing in agriculture, but there's five that are key. It's rice, it's wheat, it's, um, it, 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 it's palm oil, um, it's whiskies, it's poultry products. And we think in all of these products, the conversation we've had with the importers is that South Africa will be able to have sufficient wheat supplies at least for the year. And uh, in Russia or in the Black Sea, we typically would import about 32% of our wheat from that area. Now, with that not viable at this time around, we are looking at other origins, uh, parts of Europe, in Australia, in Canada, those are some of the origins where we've been seeing South African wheat imports coming from. And we think that um, as well as what the conversation we're hearing from all of the food companies and, and the traders, they think that there might be sufficient supplies um, in as far as that is concerned. The only key risk is of course the price because all of that is coming at a relatively higher price now, which is the point that is represented by that red line in the, in the chart on your, on your left hand side. On palm oil, that is one of the key things that we didn't really foresee because South Africa imports about half a million tons of palm oil a year. About 66% on average of that a year comes from Indonesia. Now, with that not being viable, of course, we used to rely with the remain for the remainder from Malaysia. And I think there will be a lot of demand for Malaysians looking for the palm oil from them. What puts South Africa at a slightly fortunate place is that we also have the second largest uh, sunflower oil, um, sunflower seed um, uh, crop this year, which I think second largest in history, which I think is going to assist us to an extent on improving uh, the availability of vegetable oils. But there will still be a huge gap for that palm oil that we are importing. Later on in the year, we also hear from our colleagues in the Western Cape that they plan to plant the record level area in as far as the canola through heat. And we think if that materializes, it will also improve the oil supplies in, into South Africa. So some of the things that we think are um, uh, that, and I think on prices, you all see that, and, and the media has covered oils quite significantly over the past couple of days. Um, now, let me quickly transition um, and look into the farmer side to say, for farmers, what does all this mean? What we are seeing from a farmer perspective is, of course, the rise in the inputs. Uh, because one might think that those higher prices of commodities are a enough incentive for farmers to be able to increase their plantings. But I think the inputs are rising at even a much faster pace. If you think about last year when farmers started planting in October, fertilizer prices in South Africa were plus 60% up on year-on-year -year basis on average, roughly. 
And if you look at it now, for example, which is the chart on the right hand side, you can pretty much see how prices have increased on top of the increase that we already seeing last year. And part of the story is, of course, started with China last year, where there were limited supplies of fertilizer material out of China. But now Russia is, of course, um, the, 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 the key challenge. The chart on the left hand side just shows you who are the major exporters of fertilizer. And you see that Russia is on the lead with about 14% of the global fertilizer exports. So that's the key issue that we are all worried about. And that's the key thing that farmers are worried about. But of course, uh, the conversations again, we've had with input companies. It seems to us, if we are understanding them well from an active side, is that there is sufficient supplies of fertilizer in the market in South Africa for the upcoming season. But the key issue or the key challenge is gonna be a price. So we will see if farmers will change their behavior of planting or their behavior of utilization of fertilizer. And of course, if they change the utilization the, the, on about how much fertilizer they apply, that could have implications for yields. But that's something we will know about October, November, later in the year. What we are seeing now though as a positive is that for winter crops that are started, uh, that farmers are already starting preparing soils for right now in the Western Cape, we're seeing them that they are planting an um, uh, uh, area that is actually more than what they had planted last year. That's what they intend to plant. We will see if at the end of it, uh, it will really be that reality, even with these fertilizer prices higher as they are. So that for us is encouraging them because it means that, yes, there are cost pressures for the farming sector, but they are not staying out of the land. And that is an important and a positive thing when we think about food security in the country. But this is a major challenge. And we guess then this is also going to have implications even in some of the other industries that are linked to agriculture. If you think about last year, for example, one of the industries that benefited from a robust agricultural activity, in fact, for the past two years, 2020 and 21, was the agricultural machinery industry. We saw a period where tractor sales were rising by double digit for almost two years. And it's still really the reality even at the start of this year. Sentiment was up, the chart that you are seeing on the screen, it really measures the agribusiness confidence index in South Africa. Anything that is above that bench line, that benchmark line at 50 shows that there's optimism. So the sector, there was a lot of enthusiasm um, that we were seeing uh, uh, for quite some time. A and it's only now where we are seeing that there's starting to be some pessimism. And of course, I think that this sentiment indicator is important when we think about fixed investment in agriculture. If it indeed does decline below the level of 50, it also means that the fixed investments that farmers will be putting on are going to be negatively affected. And we think that's an all likelihood over the next couple of quarters. If you also think about these cost pressures that I was mentioning in as far as the inputs are concerned. Now, that's the story at a very brief level. I've skipped a couple of things, but that's the gist of how we see it from an active side or with, on, on a geopolitics. But of course, the other reality of South Africa is the KZN challenge. To say, are those um, introducing a significant enough challenges that they change even the view that we have assumed are, 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 are above? And uh, my answer on that is that no. KZN is an important uh, player uh, in the sugar production, dairy, poultry, fruits, but, and it makes a good proportion, about 30% of South African dairy head is in KZN, 12% of our poultry, eggs and pigs, 81% of our sugar is produced in there. But in all of the information that we are receiving from our, from our friends and colleagues that are down there that have done the surveys, it seems to us that the sugarcane industry is one of those, at least in agriculture, that has experienced a wide um, enough uh, damage in there. It's, a, it's a, quite a sizable hectare, but in value terms, it's just over 200 million rands of estimated losses um, that the farmers have experienced. It means then that in the next couple of months, they will have to be doing some bit of replanting. But that replanting is going to be costly if you think about the fertilizers um, and the cost that I've just mentioned. The macadamia industry is also one of those that have experienced losses, but of course our colleagues uh, do not think that the, 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 the losses are, are, are that significant, but they are still doing some bit of a calculation and making the estimates onto that. But overall, this doesn't change that growth story picture where I was saying we are contracting this year by anywhere between three and 5%, having accounted also for some of these issues. What we think though is the most significant damage is of course on the infrastructure. Uh, in the network industries, the roads, the bridges, the ports, you all have seen what has been happening there. And I think this is where we have to give credit to the colleagues at Transnet 
because I think in all of these difficult circumstances that were being faced on reopening the ports, they were agile enough and they were quick enough to work with all of the stakeholders and ensure that the ports get they get the ports to be operational, even though not optimal. Um, under very difficult circumstances. I don't know those of you that are in the call and had a, a, an ability to travel to KZN during that period, about two weeks back or so, you probably saw how devastating the situation was. But now the ports are operational. Um, but of course, I think the huge challenge is about how do we rebuild the road, net, the, 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 the network industries, which is the roads, the rail and the ports. That's where I think the significant damage is. KZN is also important for, for, for grains, particularly maize, along with the Eastern Cape, but production of maize in those provinces is less than a million uh, tons. So we think it doesn't change the inflation view per se that we were mentioning, but I think we should never underestimate the cost of the damage that is in very same network industries that I was mentioning. But of course, this is also an area that I think going forward, when we think about the rebuilding process um, in KZN, but we think that it should be a situation really across South Africa because the heavy rain since about October, they exacerbated the destruction in the road network in South Africa in general. So the rebuilding can begin in KZN, but I think we need to think about the whole process of investment and rebuilding the network industries across South Africa. And this is also perhaps maybe a, a place where employment um, in some of the small town and municipalities can actually be. But this is a task both of private sector and government leading it, and also getting making sure that the municipalities are not in the deep rot that we are currently seeing now, because the poor performance of the municipality is also what has plunged the network industries in South Africa to the devastating state that it is in. And I emphasize this a lot because we are a country that actually transports about 80% uh, of its agricultural products, particularly grains, by road network. So we really need to get the roads working. And we are also an export-oriented sector, which exports about 51% of what we produce in agriculture, which means then for growth and long-term sustainability, we really need to get the infrastructure uh, going. And I think that thinking of it as I head towards closing needs to be tied up with the broader story of saying, even if we are developing agriculture, general, even in areas like my own province in the Eastern Cape, where we are not as advanced in agriculture, uh, but there is a potential that can be unlocked. That unlocking of the potential lies in squarely with this infrastructure story. The map you are seeing on a screen, for example, the dotted line, the dots in the map is where the concentration of infrastructure currently is in South Africa. It's in central uh, South Africa there by Renfontein and all of these areas, and also in the Western Cape. KZN and Eastern Cape has minimal infrastructure, but also those are the areas with the potential for long-term growth in agriculture. I call those areas Eastern Cape, KZN, and Limpopo, and southern parts of Mpumalanga as the growth frontiers for agriculture when we are looking at 2030, 2050. So, but all of that will need to be anchored on this rebuilding and rejuvenation of the network industries that I was speaking about from the bottom there. So, all in all, in conclusion, colleagues, what I'm saying is, uh, we are not in a place of a potential shortage of products in South Africa as a result of what's going on in geopolitics or KZN, but there are price risks and price pressures, which I think for, for consumers will be a key issue. We're seeing inflation, consumer price inflation at about 6%. We are seeing contraction in agriculture between 3 and 5% this year. We don't see a huge dent in employment, and we think for long-term growth, the focus should be on network industries and agriculture should be prioritized because there is enough evidence which says that growth in agriculture is two or three times more effective at reducing uh, poverty than any other sector as growth in the economy in South Africa. And I think that's an important insight um, when we're looking at our triple challenges as a country, which is of rising poverty, uh, higher unemployment, as well as inequality, and also why we are always talking too much about agriculture. It's really all on that. But let me stop there and thank you so very much for your patience to listen to me speak for over uh, 15 minutes, nearly 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, back to you. Wendili, thanks. Really appreciate. Uh, folks, if you've got questions, drop them in. Well, Wendili, I want to pick up on, on, on that last point you were making around employment and agriculture. And I don't know why my, uh, my video is not working, but it'll come in a moment. The, the question is, is how much 
what, what, how many people are employed in agriculture in agriculture in, in, in the various levels? And I suppose it's a difficult question because part of it is people at the farm and that is going to be seasonal to a degree. Um, and then, of course, there's folks at the silos. There's folks who are working in, you know, fertilizer. But do we have a sense of what our employment is? Absolutely, Simon. We, we currently have in South Africa uh, around about 862,000 people or so um, that are employed at primary level of agriculture. Um, and we also have just around about 440,000 people or so that are employed um, um, in the agro-processing side of agriculture. Uh, when we look at the primary level, I would say about half or so of the people are always seasonal uh, labor. But of course, we, we never really drop below the long-term employment level in, in South Africa's agriculture by long-term. I mean, 10 years, if you look at average over the 10 years, it's around about 760,000 people. So for over the past couple of years, we've always been above that average in as far as the employment conditions in primary agriculture. So very good um, employer, particularly for the fact that um, uh, not all fellow South Africans were as blessed to, 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 to be able to acquire skills that allowed them to work in manufacturing and the other sectors. So agriculture has that ability to absorb them and offer economic opportunities. I take the point on that. A question coming from Peter Eckstein. He's asking, in particular, how much of our land are we currently utilizing for, for crops, particularly bulk crops? And I'm going to tie that in with a follow-up question uh, from one of the other uh, attendees, which is, how much are we able to, in, in the shorter term perhaps, pick up that slack from, from the Ukraine-Russia uh, war? I'm thinking, for example, sunflowers. You did indicate that it does look like we're picking up on sun, some sunflower production, but I, I imagine it's not just a case of deciding to sort of double capacity. It's a process and, and probably a slow one. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Look, so South Africa, we, we are a semi-arid country. Um, in, in, in general. Um, and right now for large part of our crops, particularly food crops, we are producing at an area of around about just under 4.5 million hectares. That's all of our field crops in, in, in totality that, 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 we, that we, are, we are producing in. Um, so there is still capacity, of course, to, to, to increase that. We have, for example, reliable data that tells us that there is still about Two million hectares or so that can be explored if we think about the under potential, the underutilized land in parts of the Eastern Cape, mm -hmm. as well as the former homelands part of the province. You tag that up with KZN um, and parts of Limpopo. So there's capacity to, to increase that. But that's a, a key thing that leads to land policy and the others that, that needs to be resolved over time for us to be able to, to acquire that. How much can we able to take up a slack on the on the global dynamics? Um, we, we're not really in a position to export a lot, unfortunately. Uh, we, with, with all of the sunflowers that we are, we, we are now seeing as an improvement in our harvest, it's really going to enable us as South Africa not to be at a shortage uh, space. Because you will remember, Simon, from various conversations we have had, that we are a country that imports about 100,000 tons or so of sunflower a, a year before this good crop, of course, that we are experiencing. I take, yeah, it's sort of self-sufficiency more than anything else. And another question from Peter and around that self-sufficiency, which is, as a country, why aren't we, why are we not able to? Because you know, self-sufficient within the fertilizer space, because certainly we've got local producers um, and, and you, know, you would think that they could ramp up that capacity while Peter and I are both being a, a little perhaps naive here. No, I mean... Uh, you guys are, are are raising important point, but I think you, you you must, Peter, appreciate the fact that South Africa in general, we we are a net export of food. I mean, we mm. are exporting about 51% in value terms of what we produce. So half of what we produce in value terms goes to export markets. And last year, that we reached a record a value of about $12.4 billion of agricultural products were exported in South Africa. And that was not only a price story, even in volumes. Um, there was a record, despite all of the logistical challenges that we, we, we 
there are limitations because of the weather conditions, which is why we were always bringing about half a million tons of palm oil uh, from Asia. It's because we cannot really produce uh, palm oil in South Africa. We are a semi-arid country. So that was one of the key story. And of course, then when you begin saying, can we produce more sunflower in order to counter our reliance uh, on the palm oil imports. That's where competition begins to be an issue because the very same land, which is the, the, the northwest and western parts of Free State, which are our key for producing sunflower seed, is also the land that is key for producing white maize. So uh, what we have been thinking yeah. about is to say relocate maize out of a central South Africa to an extent, not all maize, to the Eastern Cape and uh, parts of KZN then do a lot of, 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 of oil seeds, sunflowers, and soybean in Central South Africa, mainly because the processing of all of the crushing of oils, it's already within the Gauteng area and the Free State. So we can as well expand there, and then we expand maize uh, down in there. But that's something that uh, is, is long-term, but is completely doable to, to ease up our reliance. Wheat is almost the same story. Um, the cost of producing wheat in central parts of South Africa is just too high. The reason, for example, after 1994, we saw wheat declining in South Africa, the hectares, is because before 1994, that wheat was actually propped up by government subsidies. Yeah. It was never as viable to areas. So there are those dynamics. Thanks. We spoke uh, just as the Ukraine war started, so it would have been uh, uh, late February, I suppose, um, particularly about the impact. And one of the issues was uh, a fair bit of our citrus exports goes into Ukraine and Russia. I, I remember, I think it was single digits, but sort of high single digits. Have you got any sense if they've managed to find other markets for that citrus or do they try and move it into the local market instead? That, that, that's actually the point, uh, as Simon, I was, I was, I was trying to, 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 to say, we're likely to see some bit of price pressures yeah. in, the, in the food industry. In part, it will be coming out of that citrus industry because it hasn't been as easy to ensure that we find another market of moving that citrus to come to the local market. So that's something that is still in the pipeline. Our colleagues at CGA are working uh, with the government to ensure, um, to, to try to look for some of the markets for that. But I don't think that we'll be able to find markets as quick as for, for, for that. It's about 12% or so of our, of our produce that goes to that market. So yes, it will largely have to be utilized in the domestic market. Okay, so we're gonna get some cheap citrus. Can't argue with that. A question from Derek, he's asking in particular the, the container shortages. And I know I've spoken with a lot of CEOs in the logistics space and there's been all the challenges of, you might have the boat in the right place, but you haven't got containers in the right place. Has, has that been an added challenge in, in the supply chain crisis that we've been seeing uh, globally pretty much during the pandemic or has, is that sort of less of, a, of, a, of, of an issue that they've been having in the agri space? I mean, the logistics remain um, a, a major challenge um, and for agriculture, it was basically one of the key challenges that we had uh, much of last year. So, so, so absolutely, absolutely on that. But I must say again, to give flowers to Transnet because I think they were able last year to, to, to assist speaking to that $12.4 billion I was talking about and also record uh, vo 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 on, on volumes. So South Africa did push through working in all of these um, collaboration with, 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 with the logistic industries, but it remains a key issue. The logistics are not as smooth as pre-COVID, so that, that remains a key, a key risk. Yeah, and I take your point on on, on Transnet. Uh, certainly, you're not the first person. I was chatting with Andrew Waller recently from from Grinrod, and he also said, you know, bouquets to to Portia Derby and her team there at at at, at Transnet. A, a, a last question coming in again from Peter. He says, is there a database somewhere online of commodities that we that we that we import um, and that we could sort of utilize to produce more? And I think Peter perhaps either is or an upcoming farmer. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I wouldn't say a database online, but I think I had covered to, to an extent also mm. within my blog, which is just my name, surname.com. If you see if Peter scrolls there, there's something where I talk about localization or you can just use a search word, but there, there are articles that are, that are in there. And perhaps for ease of communication, if he's unable to do that, I could drop something to you, Simon, to make sure that it's communicated to him. But we, we have a clear, a good indication, Peter, of, of all of these dynamics and we, we can gladly share that with you.
Perfect. Uh, and I will drop the, the 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 blog URL into the the, the chat for the event. Um, it is just wendelishlobo.com. Let me make sure I get that going to everyone. Uh, you can go grab that. Folks, I'm going to park that there. Um, that is the, uh, t the presentation. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. I just need to copy that properly. I'm pasting something weird. Uh, there's Wendelish's uh, uh, blog with a whole bunch of data there. And of course, Peter, if you don't come right, you're welcome to drop me a mail as always, Simon at Just One Lap. Uh, Wendelish Schlobo, really appreciate the time this evening. Uh, really enjoy your insights as always uh, and the time that you afforded us this evening. Uh, ladies and gents who attended, uh, Peter and Derek, uh, thank you both for the questions coming through. And everyone, uh, have a good evening further. Stay safe, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Thanks all.